I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about Cymbalta. Duloxetine, also known frequently by its brand name Cymbalta, is a serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's what we consider relatively evenly balanced, so it's fairly evenly working on both serotonin and norepinephrine systems. It's approved in the U.S. by the FDA for treating depression, generalized anxiety, fibromyalgia, and for two different chronic pain syndromes, one chronic neuromuscular pain and two chronic pain associated with diabetic neuropathy. It often winds up as a second or third tier item for treating ADHD, and there are a very meager amount of studies showing that it's helpful. They do support that it's helpful for ADHD. So I am mostly arguing from basic science, neuropharmacology reasoning that this is a good and effective medication for ADHD. And from my own clinical experience in which I've used it widely and talked with colleagues who have as well for the last 30 years. So it's certainly less studied than Stratera atomoxetine, even less than Remlofaxine Effexor or the tricyclics. But I'd say for many people, Cymbalta is likely to be as effective for ADHD symptoms as any of these, and it is likely to have a better side effect profile for many. Um, So this isn't a good fit for everybody, clearly. And you should certainly discuss any medications with your providing, prescribing doctors. Um, so I'm not making specific medical recommendations right now. So jumping into how SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors work or what we think they're work, how they're working. So these drugs bind to transporter molecules. And the transporter is a protein molecule that's sitting in the cell membrane of neurotransmitters. And when the neurotransmitter releases serotonin or dopamine or glutamate or some other neurotransmitter, it's released into the synaptic cleft between two neurons and acts on the secondary neuron, binding the receptors there, but then quickly dissociates, drifts off. And if we didn't have a mechanism to stop this, then it would just be a constant on signal and not a very controllable one. So... For certain neurotransmitters, there are chemicals that chop up the neurotransmitter that's floating around in the neurotrans in the synaptic space. But much more commonly, or much more importantly for the ending the signal for most neurotransmitters are reuptake transporter molecules. So there's a specific serotonin transporter, there's a serotonin releasing cells, there's a, neuro, a norepinephrine transporter molecule there. So the reuptake inhibitors bind to those transporter molecules and block the reuptake of the neurotransmitter. So they don't create more of the neurotransmitter. They allow the transmitter that's in the synaptic space to exist there longer and to bind for a longer time, therefore boosting the activation of the second nerve without actually boosting necessarily levels of the neurotransmitters. Now, serotonin, we, we had for depression, serotonin neurotransmitters, Prozac, fluoxetine, Paxil, peroxetine, sertraline, so oft, um, so I tell most, many of these were out before we had any commercially available serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. I'll qualify that in a few minutes. But some psychiatrists and other doctors wondered, you know, the SNRIs generally well tolerable, not too many dangerous effects, but a fair number of side effects. The S serotonin reuptake inhibitors cause nausea, uh, sexual side effects, not least a quarter to a third of people with effective doses. At least a quarter of people starting out on them feel revved up and agitated. Um, many people in the long term, particularly too high a dose of an SSRI, feel apathetic. Weight gain is particularly associated with paroxetine, Paxil, and maybe some of the others. Some people have excessive sweating or dry mouth. So if you're messing with two neurosystems now, are you going to get twice as many side effects? And the answer is pretty clearly not when you're comparing SNRIs to SSRIs. And it's even better than that in some ways. So 
There are some side effects that don't seem to be changed substantially, like the nausea is there about to the same extent with the SNRIs as SR, SSRIs. The initial agitation, again, happens to about a quarter of people with either class of drugs. But many of the traditional SSRI side effects are mitigated, ameliorated, decreased, improved with the addition of the norepinephrine action, boosting action. So particularly sexual side effects are, depending on which drug, about half as common and also much like, likely to be as severe with the SNRIs compared to the SSRIs. That's not zero incidence of occurrence, but much lower. There's much less likelihood of sedation. There is considerably less likelihood of apathy or emotional blunting, not that it never happens, and less likelihood of weight gain. Um, sweating certainly can still be a problem. So what, what the problems do we get new when we introduce the norepinephrine action? And the commonest ones are mild cardiac actions. So SNR, serotonin, pure serotonin reuptake, selective reuptake inhibitors, tend not to affect heart rate or blood pressure, whereas there are group averages, a few points increase in heart rate and blood pressure. So far, I haven't seen any data that implicates these in terms of long-term cardiac problems, but it also has not been looked at closely. So that tends to be a mild side effect as far as we know. There's also a few things like urinary problems with the, the sphincter, urinary bladder sphincter that can happen with once we introduce noradrenergic action that's unlikely with the pure SSRI. Um, and there are specific side effects with some of the drugs in the SNRI class that are class specific. So among the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, they are different drugs. They have different half-lives. They, they exist in the body or degraded to different states or different rates. There are drug-drug interactions, which may be different between the members of this class. And actually, the potency at the receptors, serotonin or the norepinephrine receptor, changes fairly significantly um, within this class of drugs. And we're talking about binding to these transporter molecules, the, the serotonin transporter or the norepinephrine transporter. There's two different ways we can talk about them. One is the selectivity, whether it's relatively more potent for a serotonin reuptake action or, or a norepinephrine reuptake action. So selectivity is a relative comparison between how strongly the drug affects the two. And that's different than the absolute binding, So, which is how the, the concentration of the drug it takes to just fill half the receptors. Potency can have two slightly different meanings. So I'll Jump into that when I'm talking more specifically about drugs. So the first SNRI in the market in the U.S. was venlafaxine or Effexor. It was introduced in 1993, and it is considerably stronger on serotonin transporters than on norepinephrine, with at least a 30 to 1 ratio. And in fact, at starting doses, at doses below 100 milligrams, most experts would say venlafaxine has minimal to no norepinephrine action. So if you're taking low-dose effects, or you might as well be taking a pure serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, the initial drug was a two or three times a day medication for depression, and it was only four years later, um, in 1997, that it was approved as an extended release. Far and away, the majority of effects are prescribed now is only the extended release form. One of the downsides of using effects, are particularly in an ADHD population, is that it leaves the receptors very quickly. So it not only has a short half-life, it jumps off the receptors quickly, which means it is either the worst or tied for the worst in terms of antidepressant withdrawal syndromes, and the tie would be with Paxil paroxetine. So these two account for a substantial majority of the people who have problems getting off of antidepressants. Um, and again, if you are, for some people who've been on some effects of venlafaxine for months at a time, just missing a single dose can induce withdrawal reactions within an hour of the expected time. And there's some people actually who are taking it on an everyday basis 
who are going through withdrawal every day for an hour or two before they take their daily daily dose. So to me, that makes it a two reasons it's a poor match for ADHD, even though there are a small number of studies, including some um, random control blinded studies showing it's effective in ADHD. It's going to be harsh on people who miss a dose and compared to other serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, it's really weak on the norepinephrine and all available evidence points to that norepinephrine action is important for helping with ADHD. It's not the serotonin component. One of the things that happens when your body gets hold of a venlafaxine, it breaks it down into what's called a, a different molecule, just one change. It's called des venlafaxine. The same company got a patent for des venlafaxine marketed as in the U.S. as Pristique in 2008. Um, it is, des venlafaxine is slightly less serotonin biased. So it's maybe a 15 to 1 ratio instead of a 30 to 1 ratio. Um, the Europeans never approved Pristique des venlafaxine. I've heard some reports say that they didn't approve it because it didn't seem effective for depression. The other studies that seem more convincing to me are that it wasn't approved because the Europeans felt it wasn't distinctly different enough from the and the vaccine are offering much beyond it. So it's, again, available in the U.S. as an antidepressant, but there are studies looking at it for ADHD. So, so desven, the vaccine, or Pristique, is active at norepinephrine transporter molecules at its lowest available doses, which are 50 milligrams. Then in 2004, which is the focus of our talk today, is duloxetine, or Cymbalta, was approved. And this is a much more evenly balanced, somewhere the relative receptor or transporter potency is about between 5 or 10 to 1 instead of 30 to 1 in terms of it does seem to hit serotonin somewhat more strongly than the norepinephrine, but, but a more balanced ratio. Um, again, this would make it a more ideal match for ADHD, again, more potent relatively on the norepinephrine than certainly than venlafaxine. And one other issue is that there does seem to be some dopamine transporter action from duoxetine, Cymbalta. Now, this is 25 times, so it's, again, strongest on serotonin, about 5 to 10 times weaker on norepinephrine. And then compared to the norepinephrine, still another 25 times weaker on dopamine, but that's still greater action on dopamine than any of the other drugs I'll be talking about today. And again, both dopamine and norepinephrine seem to be potent ways for messing with them. Boosting levels essentially seem to be potent ways for helping with ADHD. So duloxetine, when it came out, was approved for depression. It was also approved for shortly after that for pain connected with diabetic neuropathy. Um, and the good thing there is that meant it was studied extensively in people without mental health issues. So looking at things in terms of weight gain or other side effects, one aspect that clouds so much of research on mental health drugs is the person already has depression or anxiety. Depression and anxiety influence lots of different side effects, not that diabetes can't also affect side effects, but you're looking at a population and may give you cleaner answers to what real side effects are. So the nice thing was in the diabetic population, um, the weight gain over the course of an entire year was comparable to the placebo group and comparable to what happens in the U.S. population, which is everyone's steadily gaining weight year after year. So it's received over time additional indications for generalized anxiety and for pain resulting from chronic musculoskeletal pain to help with both the diabetic pain and the musculoskeletal pain. And it's been studied in HIV-related neuropathy and sort of and several other pain syndromes. It seems that the norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake blockade interferes with what's called gating at the level of the spinal cord. So with chronic pain, it's not just the receptors at the peripheral in the toe or the foot or wherever, fingers, wherever you're having your chronic pain. It's that that pain signal gets amplified, gets repeated, and causes persistent activation of pain centers in the brain. And by changing how the spinal cord is processing some of that information, 
can, for some people with chronic pain, provide substantial relief. So a few other things. So venlafaxine affects or is pretty clean in terms of not having too many drug-drug interactions. That makes it ideal for some patient populations. In contrast, one of the downsides of duloxetine is it is metabolized by both 2D6 and 1A2 of the P450 enzymes. So there's several other antidepressants and other drugs like Bluvox, Paxil, and Wellbutrin, which are moderately strong 2D6 inhibitors, boost Cymbalta levels if you're taking these two drugs together. Also, um, Cymbalta itself is a milder 2D6 inhibitor, not as potent as these others, but it can affect other drugs that are processed by 2D6. That's what we had on the market in the U.S. until 2009 when milnasopran, the third serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, got on the market. Savella was a brand name. It was only approved by the FDA for fibromyalgia, so it's had a very low profile, particularly or including in the psychiatric community. Not lots of people used it on this side of the Atlantic. In Europe, it was approved for depression, and it does seem to be an effective antidepressant. And in 2014, the left-handed isomer, the lethal milmasopran, was approved in the U.S. for treating depression. And Savella itself is close to even. Like, so Cymbalta is a 5 to 1 or maybe 10 to 1 stronger on serotonin than norepinephrine. Milmasopran is probably about a two to one, so really evenly balanced. And Levo milmasopran, by most studies, is closer to the other way, one to two in terms of stronger action on norepinephrine relative to serotonin, um, very weak, negligible action on dopamine. Sorry for throwing that in. So ideally, Savella would be a better match even for ADHD and then in terms of potency of that norepinephrine reuptake action. The biggest downside of it is it tends to be quite expensive because it's only a brand name medication in the U.S. And often insurance companies will say, we have these other SNRIs out there, go use them. We don't care if you demonstrated this works, we're not going to approve it. And the downside of that greater noradrenergic activity, it is more likely to cause agitation when people start it. Insomnia is a side effect when they're continuing to take it. So I'm, I've sort of been pushing duloxetine as a good and logical agent, and I've seen it work well for ADHD. Why wasn't it ever approved for ADHD, or why isn't there even that much research on it for ADHD? And part of that is who makes duloxetine? Duloxetine, I mean, now it's being made by a number of generic makers. Duloxetine was brought to market by Eli Lilly, who also brought Prozac to market. And what other really important ADHD drug, drug did Eli Lilly develop? It was Stratera, the norepinephrine selective reuptake inhibitor. So at the end of 2002, Eli Lilly was the first FDA-sanctioned drug for treating ADHD that was not a stimulant. That was a pretty exclusive market back then. Still not a lot of options. I don't have any direct evidence of this, but I think they did not want to encroach, muddy the waters, mess with sort of their monopoly on non-stimulant alternatives to for treating ADHD. So they had absolutely no interest in proving, demonstrating, or bringing to market Cymbalta duloxetine as a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So again, Stratera is 20 times stronger on the norepinephrine. It does have some serotonin reuptake action, but it's 20 times stronger on norepinephrine and on serotonin. It's very similar binding to the norepinephrine transporter molecule. They are almost exactly the same potency if you're looking at the two. And again, you'd think, oh, just we're messing with one neurotransmitter here. That should be a simpler side effect profile. What I've seen and when I've talked to dozens of colleagues and to patients with Cymbalta, I can pretty clearly predict and tell to patients what to expect in terms of side effects. With Stratera, there seems to be much more variability patient to patient in terms of what to tell them to expect. And as you change dosages or titrate upwards, there's much less predictability. I've seen people who were stated in a low dose and became revved up higher, or I've seen the opposite picture. So 
side effects seem to be across the board, whereas, and it may take many weeks before someone gets to a therapeutic level for treating ADHD. On the other hand, with Cymbalta duloxetine, many people can start at 60 milligrams, which is an effective antidepressant dose. It's also effective for many for ADHD symptoms, and they get benefit the day they start there. So there are certainly, again, situations. I have people for breast cancer on tamoxifen, and 2D6 action of Cymbalta may interfere with that. Um, so in that population, Effexor is a better way to go. But for many people with ADHD, the duloxetine, I would argue, is a better drug for them than atomoxetine or stratera. Now, I'm sort of pretending that the SNRIs were a new class of drugs. And in actuality, the SNRIs predated the serotonin selective antidepressant market. So the drugs that are mainstay, mainstay for treating depression before Prozac and the pure SSRIs got unseen were the tricyclic antidepressants. Yes, we had monoamine oxidase inhibitors in the U.S. They've never been more than 1% or 2% of the market for antidepressant treatment because of uncommon but potentially dangerous interactions with certain foods. So the tricyclics, many of them have been found to be effective for treating ADHD in most lists of what's recommended, they are often pushed more strongly than something like duloxetine. I think that is a terrible sort of public health level decision. Again, I'm not denying that there are some individuals who get good results with minimal side effects. Great for them, but I'll jump into why the tricyclics should almost never be offered to anyone until after they've tried something like duloxetine. So again, with the tricyclics, we have two, two major groups of tricyclic antidepressants, what are called the secondary amines. So two different amine structures on it are disipramine, nortriptyline, protriptyline. Those are all primarily norepinephrine transporter reuptake inhibitor blockers. So strongly norepinephrine. We also have what are called the tertiary amines, amitriptyline, clomipramine, doxepin, imipramine, trimipramine. Those are all stronger on the serotonin. So those are the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors that are fairly like our effects here, Cymbalta and Savella drugs. So that would be all well and good. Why do I think they're not great drugs? So the tricyclics are what we call sloppy drugs or unclean drugs. Not only are they having effects on serotonin and norepinephrine, which are how we think they help with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, and ADHD, but they affect a bunch of other systems that we don't particularly want them to be affecting, usually. So they are, most of them are really good antihistamines. And in fact, amitriptyline is a stronger antihistamine than Benadryl. Benadryl diphenhydramine for years was the best-selling antihistamine. Um, it was also, before Ambien got on the scene, the most commonly used drug in hospitals to help people sleep. Antihistamines of this class, we have more recent classes, which aren't as sedating, but first-generation antihistamines, depending on which histamine receptors they hit, antihistamines cause sedation. They cause weight gain. They can cause confusion. Most people don't like those. Most people on particularly therapeutic levels of tricyclic antidepressants have some of those side effects. And the weight gain is way more prevalent than it is with SSRIs. The Tricyclics also have anticholinergic activity, which causes constipation, dry mouth, blurred vision, potentially confusion, urinary retention, and maybe most seriously, if those aren't enough deterrent, the cholinergic cells are the acetylcholine cells in the brain are the ones that start deteriorating early and to the greatest extent in Alzheimer's disease and at the top of every geriatric don't use these drugs warning are drugs with strong anticholinergic action. For many of them, we haven't clearly shown it is absolutely a cause and effect relationship, but there's pretty compelling evidence that long-term use of anticholinergics is a risk factor for developing dementia. That's not the end of it. 
more dirty things that the tricyclics do. They also have alpha adrenergic action, which causes something called orthostatic hypotension. This can happen with other medicines as well, which is dizziness when you stand up. You're, you get lightheaded when you change your body's posture. Um, and the most worrisome issue with the tricyclics is that they also are able to block the fast sodium channels that are on muscle cells, in the heart muscle cells, specific type of muscle. And that can cause arrhythmias. And the tricyclics have what is called a very narrow therapeutic index or window, where just a few dosages more than a daily therapeutic dose. I mean, there are people who have died from taking one extra tricyclic. It's not usually that dangerous, but taking a week's worth or two weeks' worth is fairly commonly can kill people. And these are still drugs that are at the top towards the top of the list in U.S. poison control centers for serious deaths and outcomes, even though proportion-wise, they are not particularly widely used drugs, I mean, so it's disproportionately dangerous. So a few things, I, I can run through the numbers as to what the KI, which is a concentration in animals, sort of binding potential of the different receptors, but I think I've beat that. But again, relative potency is one thing. How strongly you're affecting serotonin transporter relative to norepinephrine and dopamine. Again, duloxetine looks pretty good compared to certainly the effects are not quite as good as Savella or some of the tricyclics. Again, brings in some dopamine action, which may be relevant. Some people focus on those transporter binding numbers as if they are some written in gold and have all the meaning in the world. And there's at least one study that showed when you're talking about transporter, actually how strong the drug binds to the transporter may actually be slightly different than how strongly it affects reuptake of that neurotransmitter in the cell. So we often look at one number, but there can be differences. But that one number doesn't convey everything. And most of these numbers are developed in the test tube by looking, you grind up brain cells, you put the drugs in, you see how many you know, what concentration it takes to hit 50% of the receptors. But there is some evidence that in vitro, in the living brain, animal brain, these relative potencies may not be, you may find different ratios or slightly different effects in a real living organism. And that there's certainly likely to be species differences if you're looking in monkeys versus rodents versus humans. Again, my argument that duoxetine is a good drug is for ADHD is that it, like the other SNRIs, like atomoxetine, like Ritalin and amphetamine, but unlike serotonin, real pure serotonin agents, increases extracellular levels of both norepinephrine and dopamine in the prefrontal cortex in both rats and humans. And that seems to be quite relevant for ADHD, where in general we see lower activation or lower activity of norepinephrine and dopamine in prefrontal cortex. That's a great oversimplification. The very limited research data we have on ADHD and Cymbalta, and all of this is pretty close to 15 years old, is that both impulsive and inattentive symptoms seem to be responsive to duloxetine, that the magnitude of the effect is similar to other non-amphetamine medications. So it's comparable to Stratera. It's comparable in many. And again, if you listen to my talk on Ritalin, I'd say there's compelling evidence that Ritalin maybe shouldn't be classified as a stimulant that in terms of benefits for ADHD. We have amphetamine up here and Ritalin clusters. Maybe it's at the top of, but its benefits are very similar, comparable to Wellbutrin, Stotera, Cymbalta, Savella, and Lefaxine. And there are our studies just looking at depressed individuals, so not explicitly with ADHD, but showing that both attention and executive function can improve giving Cymbalta to those individuals. Another advantage of a dual-acting SNRI is that serotonin action may well treat comorbid depression and anxiety, and depending on the study, but probably at least a third of people with ADHD have either significant depression or anxiety, and if you have one drug that could be treating all three, that would be great and effective and efficient. The downside of that is sort of the other thing. It, it could mask ADHD. So I've seen people who came to me 
who had been treated for years with something like Cymbalta and were told that they only had depression or anxiety or that their ADHD was never recognized. And Jordan may be treating to some extent their ADHD. Um, so until they take a break from the drug, it may not be clear how much ADHD is actually part of the picture. I mean, even with our best medication, which is I'm that I mean in best meaning helps the greatest proportion of people reduce ADHD symptoms and helps reduce symptoms to the greatest extent, even in that scenario, almost nobody with ADHD gets all their symptoms eradicated. So these are helpful, but unlike depression, where often we can completely eradicate depression with ADHD, we are usually lowering symptoms, not eradicating them. So I've talked longer than I thought I would talk. I will, I see there are questions waiting for me. Are there medications or other things that increase the size of one's hippocampus? So there is still not complete consensus, and there are some well-respected neuroscientists who, who disagree with this. But in general, most neurons in most mammals don't grow, well, they can grow extensions, they can have synaptic connections. They don't divide and produce offspring new brain cells. There's no neurogenesis, except some very few areas. And I'd say my interpretation is there's moderately good data that humans and most other animals can grow, mammals can grow new nerve cells in their hippocampus. One of the most consistent findings in depression neuroscience is that the longer you've been depressed or chronically anxious, the greater the shrinkage in your hippocampus is. And that clearly seems to be due to nerve cell death. Some of it might be the shrinkage of the cells that are there, but that if you've been on antidepressants, there is some preservation in most of it's looked more at hippocampal size rather than the nerve cell numbers. But many of the antidepressants do seem to preserve either neurogenitive capacity or prevent nerve cell death in the hippocampus. And again, I think the evidence does suggest that they're supporting neurogenesis on the hippocampus. And at least in rats, there's actually fairly good evidence that letting them have access to a running wheel and running in the running wheel stimulates nerve cell growth in the hippocampus. So both the antidepressants and the running wheel behavior seem to boost brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which seems to be part of the pathway. And this is not just a generic effect of any neuroactive chemical. So, you know, antipsychotics don't seem to have this effect. Benzodiazepines don't seem to have this effect. So, other ways to increase the size of hippocampus, and I'm thinking of a there's a famous London taxi cab driver study looking at when people are trained in an occupation that in the days before GPS it required extensive memorization of lots of actual information. And I'm not remembering the details of the study, whether it just indicated that they had larger hippocampuses or whether there was enough before and after to show that there was actually growth of the hippocampus. But it does seem hippocampus is intimately related or important for memory encoding and storage. And larger hippocampus does seem functionally correlated with better memory. Is sertraline good for ADHD? So there are, there's at least one prominent, I'll say, entrepreneur and psychiatrist and neuroscientist who has been doing PET scans of people's brains for 30 years or a few thousand dollars a pop, and you get nice, colorful pictures of your brain, and he's written many books and appeared in prominent places. And if you don't listen to him really carefully, when he may be a little more precise, he identifies seven or 11 or nine or 14 different types of ADHD and claims that SSRIs are perfect for a few of these types. Other researchers can't replicate these distinct subtypes he claims to find. So in general, there are lots of studies looking at SSRIs for ADHD, and it's pretty overwhelmingly no benefits beyond what the placebo provides or what may be happening from reducing concomitant anxiety 
or depression. I know there's, you know, sertraline does have some weak actions on dopamine reuptake, so it's it's not as selective there as some of the other SSRIs. Is it conceivable that at higher doses that may be helping or may some individuals may be significant, you know, significantly helped or sensitive to it and helped by that? Certainly it's possible, but I would, if, if that's what you're aiming for or going for, I would definitely go with duoxetine before I went with sertraline because it's going to have much more potent norepinephrine action than sertraline. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think relatively more potent dopamine transporter action. What's your clinical experience with blue box and drowsiness, fatigue, on par with other SSRIs or no? So in the U.S., Luvox is the one SSRI that has never been approved for depression. It was only approved for OCD. To my knowledge, I'm not sure if any of the other SSRIs have been approved for OCD. They might have now. This was purely, purely, purely a marketing decision. There were already three SSRIs on the market when Luvox, Luvox finally brought their product here. I am not aware of any evidence that Luvox is more effective for OCD or less effective for depression than any of the other SSRIs. Um, it has a much shorter half-life, so for many people, the dosing is still recommended multiple times a day. So for that reason, most people don't like to take it. I mean, there, there is some evidence with many of our short-acting antidepressants that most of their effects for depression are indirect and slow, and you know, particularly with effects are there's lots of good data that once a day dosing even in the immediate release form worked every bit as well as three times a day dosing there's evidence for well mutual with that as well um so for antidepressant effects so probably you probably don't even need to take it as instructed to get good benefits so my sample size is skewed by tiny numbers with luvox and i'd say yes i'd, I'd say probably and, and what i've seen in studies drowsiness is a little more common with it whether that's because it metabolizes how it affects melatonin or whether it's because it's less activating because of other actions. I, I don't know. I don't think we have convincing data as to why that might be. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I will sign off with stay healthy, stay happy. Good to see you all, and thanks for the intelligent, good questions, and I will be back next week. 